If it offends you, it's probably not true. Hello, this is Michael Beverly. Welcome to my channel. I have done a few other videos featuring the thoughts of Melissa Doherty, an ex New Ager who found Jesus. And now she's on a mission to make sure you believe the right stuff. And if you're not sure what the right stuff is, you just listen to her because she's the shit. I remember sitting up on my bed. I remember even how I was sitting. I'm like, wow, the sun shining through the window. And I hear birds chirping. And I felt this, this joy and this peace. It was incredible. There were two things that really struck me. First, I don't know who that person was yesterday. So in one day, she has a complete transformation. She doesn't even know who she was the day before. Yet you should believe that her experience is real and, and true spirituality. Why? Well, let's hear. I woke up with this sense of a new identity. And remember, I hadn't read the Bible. I didn't know anything about being born again or the new creation, nothing. So from her own lips, she became completely transformed, not from study, knowledge, she hasn't even read the Bible, yet she's telling you she knows it's real. Interesting. I felt like I was this new person. And the second thing was my insatiable hunger to know more about what my friend said. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is how most Christians that don't get raised and indoctrinated as children become Christians. Listen to what she said. I mean, this is her own testimony. She had an amazing transition, so much so she didn't even know who she was the day before. I don't know who that person was yesterday. And then she had an insatiable appetite and hunger to go read and study. But she's already believed. She's already bought the line. She's already totally committed. She has studied voraciously. In fact, she is in a like a seminary program right now for apologetics. Completely to support the conclusion she started with. So this video, it's entertaining. She's dressed up as the, as the devil and she's going to tell you some stuff that Satan probably would say. And the first thing she does is try to hide the cross. Well, yeah, I don't know. I think Satan, if the story was true, is a religious fanatic. And the last thing he's going to do is hide a graven image. Sorry. You've already failed on your first analogy, Melissa. And it's going to get a lot worse. So this first book, Untamed, I don't know anything about it. I looked on Amazon. It's got like a ton of reviews. It's sold millions of copies. It, it may be, it, it may not be a good book. I don't know. I can't comment. But what I can comment is on the gatekeeping. So instead of, this is very typical of this e fundamental, fundamentalist evangelical Christian types is, is wanting to gatekeep what you read about, what you think about, what music you listen to. And so the second book here, and I'm pulling this from later, I'm going to put these two clips together. It's, it's Jesus Calling. Now, when I was a Christian, I read Jesus Calling and I got a lot of value out of it. I felt Jesus, you know, Jesus loved me and so forth. Now, is it, is, is, it's too far back in my past that I read it. I don't remember exactly. And I have no idea what Melissa's objection to it. But again, why should you trust her to be your gatekeeper? For the record, yes, this is what I look like. And don't let anybody ever tell you anything different. Okay, the irony here is that the idea of, of Satan being this malevolent, you know, whether horned or, you know, I know, I know that's a caricature, but that the Christian view of Satan morphed from the Old Testament, what they call the Old Testament, which the Tanakh. So if you, if you, if you look at, say, the book of Job from a Christian perspective, it's the, you know, the evil lion roaming the earth and he's looking for somebody to devour and yada, yada, yada. 
and and Satan is the tempter and you know the the bad guy in the story. But if you look at it from a Jewish perspective, going back all the way to Genesis, Satan is an agent of God. Like Satan does nothing without God's approval, without God's and even God's direction. And of course. The Jews, like the Christians, have different sects and beliefs. And it's not, not as if it's a homogenous belief and everybody believes the same. It's just that. So I'm not saying the Jews can't see Satan as a as a tempter or a accuser. So there is there is a, a, um, there's a mixture in the belief system, but there is there is definitely this change from who. Satan, Lucifer, or the accuser um, was in the Old Testament from the Christian perspective, or the Tanakh, to when you get to Revelations, it's, it's the portrayal changes. Truth? What even is that? Yeah, okay. Th this, is a, this, is a, this is a standard, this is a standard Christian hand-waving. Oh, you all don't believe in objective truth standards, you atheists like we have objective truth because we're christians well what is it can you tell me exactly with 100 percent certainty what the requirements are to get a divorce you, you do you believe in drinking alcohol um do you think it's against god's law to wear makeup and jewelry no 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 live your truth well, isn't that exactly what you're doing, Melissa? You admitted that you accepted the whole Christian because you were a changed person before you even opened your Bible and started studying. So weren't isn't that what you were doing? And you just went back later to prove what you had already concluded was true. But, you know, what's the opposite of, of, of living your truth? Like, should people live their lies? Is like all you can do is live your truth. Here's the funny thing, Christians. What do you think you're doing? Even if you're following the Bible the best you can and you're following Christianity the best you can and you think you have a good pastor and you're following good teachers and you feel in your heart that God has spoken to you, that you're doing the best you possibly can, you're still just living your truth. And unless you think you have absolute truth and that everything that you believe is true right and good and exactly what god taught and exactly what jesus wants from you and you have no error in your theology and you have no mistakes in your life then you're just living your truth and follow your heart well i can tell you one regret i have in life and i don't have many regrets but one of the biggest things I would change in my life if I could go back would be to follow my heart. Because you know what? When you spend when you spend decades of your life doing shit for other people that you hate, you end up looking back in your life thinking, shit, I should have done something different. What she's mocking here is people following their passions and their hearts because it might not align with what Jesus wants. But that's the irony is whenever a Christian tells you they're doing what Jesus told them, it's always what they've already decided they want. Get it? It's just like Melissa's Christianity. She had a warm, fuzzy feeling. She felt it was true. Then she set, spent years and she's still in the process of proving that that one day, that one wonderful emotion was, was truth. And she's, quote, following her heart, which is fine. She wants to go to seminary and be an apologist. I think she's wasting her life. And she's just working to deceive more people and to lie. She's doing the very thing that she's accusing other people of doing, which is the irony and the sad thing. So should you follow your heart if your heart has desires that are to coerce other people and hurt other people? I don't think so. I think that's evil. But if you're... If your heart isn't violating other people, like it's not about violent coercion against others, uh, yeah, follow your heart. Now, you can't take advantage of people. And if you ask yourself, you'll know. What do Christians do? They decide what they want to do, and then they justify it after the fact. You know I'm telling you the truth. If it offends you, it's probably not true. This one cuts both ways. 
Christian slave owners were offended by the message of abolitionists. You know where liars go, right? I'm just kidding. Nobody goes there. The doctrine of hell is one of the most hateful inventions of Christianity. It's used to scare people, especially young children, into complying with the power structure. So there's only two options here. One, hell is just bullshit. It doesn't exist. Or B, God is a moral dictator monster because any, any supreme being that would create a hell for inferior beings, it would be as if a human raised puppies and any that disobeyed poured gasoline and lit them on fire. So if you think it's disgusting to light puppies on fire with gasoline, then how could you not think that this doctrine of hell is is somehow good? And don't tell me reason, 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 reason. It's a disgusting doctrine, and and making light of it is disgusting. This and is one of the reasons I'm referring to Melissa as the high priestess of hate. The doctrine of hell is a hateful doctrine. It's misanthropic. It is coercive, it is manipulative, and it is ugly. And here's the thing. If Melissa was a good person with a truly good heart, and she believed that hell was actually real, she would reject the God that created the hell. Now, I don't believe God's real, but I will say on the record, if God is real, the Christian God, and hell is real, I will take hell. Why? Because I will stand with the vast majority of people, assuming that doctrine's even true, that, that, that wide is the road that leads to destruction and narrows the path. Because at the end of the day, according to people like Melissa, heaven will be populated with mostly white European Christians. Well, fuck you. I don't want to go to that place. And then, Melissa, if you want to go there, you're a racist and a bigot. And just because God said it, or God made it, and God's, God's the, the potter and we're the clay, that doesn't mean we have to give in to terrorism and totalitarianism. We can stand up to God, and even if he sends us to hell, we will still, we'll still be standing on better ground. I will take hell before I go to heaven with you, Melissa, because I don't want to be about, I don't want to be spending eternity, eternity with the majority of white European bigot racist Christians. You guys disgust me. No, uh-uh. You do not need to ugh, read your Bible every day. This one is one of the biggest ironies ever. Reading the Bible, if she actually means reading the Bible, the whole Bible, and actually studying it, and not just listening to a Christian fundamentalist, apologists explain what it means but actually reading it yourself and not just the easy parts and the pretty parts but the whole bible and study this is one of the best ways to make atheists god is the one who made you the way that you are so if you want someone to blame just blame god the veiled bigotry and hatred here is just disgusting melissa tell me if if you had been born in Jakarta to Muslim parents, do you think you'd be an evangelical Christian? Or would you have obeyed your parents and done that? You might have been smart enough to figure out it was bullshit and you just would play along with with following Islam laws and you'd be a cultural Muslim. That's possible. But the chance that you'd become an evangelical Christian is very slim. I'm not saying it never happens, but it's very, very slim. Now, when you say God, you know, in a, you're like you're mocking this idea that people say, hey, God made me the way I am. Are you saying you picked your parents? Are you saying that you picked your culture the time you were born? Your race? Are you saying that that if somebody is born in Africa or in China, that their culture and the different religions they're exposed to, it, that they chose that? Now, if, you, if you're born in Australia or Canada or England, maybe you sort of are raised with sort of somewhat of a, 
a secular Church of England kind of religion. Right? If you're born in the American South, you're very likely going to be a Baptist or a Pentecostal or some type of a, of American fundamentalism. If you were born in if you were born in Germany a hundred years ago, you're likely to be a Lutheran, right? Like, what what is it that you think people are choosing? Uh, I'm not saying you have no free will at all, but you certainly didn't have free will to be born a white woman in America in a Christian culture. Yeah, you know that um, salvation thing that Jesus did on the cross? Yeah, well, um, you can lose that. So just try not to, okay? It's not hard. Just be perfect. Here's the funny irony. Well, the sad irony. Melissa doesn't think you can lose your salvation because anybody that falls out of the box she's created in her mind was never a Christian to begin with. So it amounts to the same thing. It's no different if she believed you could lose your salvation. So take me, for instance. Am I going to be in heaven with you, Melissa? Tell me what you've done in your life that is different than what I did in my Christian life. I was baptized around 10, 11 years old. I loved Jesus with all my heart. I was giving Bible studies to other kids when I was 11, 12, 13 years old. I went to church, of course, and tithed, and I was married in the church, and mar and I've served in the church throughout throughout like most of my adult life. Now, I realize going to church and tithing and reading your Bible and studying that those in themselves doesn't make you a a quote Christian, right? Because it has to be a changed heart. Well, I had a changed heart. I love Jesus. That's why I went on missions trips and prayed for people in the street. I love Jesus. Did I lose my salvation? I fucking hope so, because I don't want to be in heaven with bigots like you, Melissa. I'll take hell, as I previously said. So I hope you can lose your salvation. But don't you ever say I wasn't saved because I wasn't a real Christian. If once saved, all we have saved is true and the Christian message is true, then I will be in heaven. And I, if that's true, I will spit in the face of Jesus and say, I fucking hate you as long as there's one person burning in hell. Because anybody burning in hell, even the worst person in history, could have been stopped and corrected by you if you actually loved humans. You must major on those minors. It's a great distraction for you. Plus, it's uh, very entertaining for me. Well, I don't know if she realizes she's mocking herself here. If you listen to Chris Christians like Melissa, and I listened to her and did a response video to her interview with the bigots Tim and Elisa, Tim Barnett and Elisa Childers on their book tour when they, they came on Melissa's program. Complete bigots, complete racist bigots of the worst possible kind. And their message is, if you don't believe the way we believe, you are lost, you're not a real Christian, you're going to hell, you know, and all the liberal gays and atheists are all evil and blah, 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 blah. And Melissa buys onto that and promoted that, so she's also an evil, hateful person. So, majoring in the minors is a Christ Christianese for getting caught up in the little things. But let me ask you, is it really a little thing? Like if the God of the universe wants you to worship on the Sabbath and not and not bow down or pray to or have graven images in your in your house or in your prayer rooms, if the God of the universe doesn't want you to eat pork or shrimp, aren't those things important? Like are they really minor details? If God says I, I, you know, if you're a woman, don't wear flashy jewelry and makeup. And if you're a man, don't have long hair because both, but th those things are, you know, they're, they're distractions and they're, they're evil and they're wrong. Now, look, I don't, I don't buy any of this shit, but if those things aren't important, then why is it that they're in the Bible? And why do people argue about, like, can you drink alcohol? Like I did a, I did a whole nother video on that with, 
every view from here to here. So I like, well, I understand what she's saying here. Like, you know, why fight about the little details? The reason, the reason it's fun to watch professional sports like NFL or, you know, whatever, baseball, hockey, basketball. The reason those things are fun is because they have very strict rules. And without those strict rules, nobody would watch the games. They wouldn't be fun. It would be a melee and, and it would be chaos. So the, so the weird irony here is if it was really true that God had this big set of rules and he wanted you to follow them, then caring about the rules actually would make complete logical sense. Funny how Christians don't care about the 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 Torah very much. And they, they they give lip service to the Ten Commandments, but they don't even know what the Ten Commandments are. They mix up they mix up the Ten Commandments with the Decalogue. And they don't know the rules. They don't know the Jewish law because they don't care. Because why? Because Paul said, ah, you don't need to follow the rules. <sighs> like Jesus. Don't ever judge, don't be negative, and don't tell anybody that what they believe is wrong. Christians aren't good at nuance. Look, if you're having a discussion with somebody and you disagree with them, that's fine to tell somebody that you think that they're wrong. Just remember that's what you think. And as far as judging people, again, there's a nuance here. What, what non-Christians point out is that Christians, it isn't just that they judge people, it's that they're rude about it and they also want to enforce society rules to tell other people how to live. If you and I are sitting down talking and we're having a friendly discussion and you say, you know, you're a fat fuck and you should go on a diet, it, you know, if you're my friend, I'm like, yeah, I know I have a mirror, but like, I don't feel judged. But if you come to me and say, you're living this lifestyle, you're going to hell, you need to change, you need to believe in Jesus, you need to do this, blah, 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 blah. That's a different story. That is hateful, bigoted, and close-minded. You don't want to be like that now, do you? Ah, uh, Christians like you, Melissa, love to be hateful, bigoted, and close-minded. That's your industry. We get it. It's funny, though, that you actually recognize that, but don't change. It's kind of sad. I, <clears throat> I imagine people like you that you're... I imagine your self-esteem, Melissa, is like, well, yeah, I mean, your own Bible tells you you're, you're as dirty as used menstrual rags, so I understand. <clears throat> it is shameful, and it is sad, and I wish, I wish that you would stop spreading this message of hatred and bigotry, and, and the, way to, the way to stop this message of hatred and bigotry is for you to look in the mirror and ask yourself, why do I hate myself? Why do I think I'm dirty? and worthless and that I have to believe in some imaginary stuff in order to feel good about myself. Then we can make some real progress in this world. Be all inclusive, except of course, when you need to exclude others who offend you. Sometimes I wonder if these Christian apologists have actually read the Bible. <clears throat> the, the institution on earth that is the most exclusive exclusive by its own standards is Christianity. Christianity actually preaches that the road is very narrow for those who are selected and those that are elected and those that choose and those that get to go to heaven and those are the, the blessed people. And the road is very broad for those that are going to destruction. And to to act as if that you know to act as if the other side is being the the ex you know into the exclusivity and it's just bizarre that you don't recognize this weird and, and very sad irony that you're the one that's the bigot here you're the one that's the intolerant one and and you're the one that's preaching the hate i just i just don't get how you don't see that other than that you've deluded yourself that it's actually loving to exclude people.
you can come to the Bible with any preference or worldview or gender identity that you like. Then you can just shove it into the Bible however you want. <laughs> well, I kind of in a weird way agree with Melissa here. You can't really go to the Bible and not see that it's a design for for keeping a patriarchal power structure in place and dominating over those that are the weak and the marginalized <clears throat> and those that are you know the unapproved of classes and so in a weird way i sort of agree with her that that you sh you can ju you can just read the bible for what it is a collection of stories that has some quasi history and established you know the three major abrahamic religions in the world and it's interesting in that sense it's interesting it's interesting and it it you know it's 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 definitely worth reading. I'm not I'm not saying that, but if you go if you go into what what she's implying here is that you need to set aside who you are as a person and go to the Bible and just do it. You're fucking told like a sheep. Turn off your brain, get in fucking line, and do what Melissa says to do. Otherwise, you're gonna go to fucking hell. And it's just it's a pathetic message because a hell's imaginary, and two if if hell wasn't imaginary, would you really want to go to a place where Melissa's going to be told for eternity how to live? Like a child, like a farm animal, like a slave? No, thanks. No, thank you. Just fine rejecting that. Reality should be based on your imagination and what you find offensive to your truth. It's funny how she can describe Christianity and herself in a mocking way and act as if she's not living in an imaginary world that she's just invented in, in her own mind. Like, Melissa, you're just inventing this stuff. Get a clue. It is kind of funny how little Christians actually read and study the Bible. And again, as I said before, I totally endorse that. But you got to read the whole Bible and you can't cherry pick and you can't just go to your favorite apologist. Like Melissa just loves guys like Alan Parr who know nothing about ancient history. They don't have degrees in Greek or Hebrew or history. And they completely, completely distort the text just to fit their own you know their own mold or what they needed to say uh, you want you want to see something so melissa i know melissa happens to like alan parr the, for various reasons she's mentioned in other videos go and listen to alan parr pontificate about how good slavery is and how the bible slavery is good and how all and how he justifies all the wickedness of slavery it's it's like in that and then think about it like how is this person that blind? Well, and do and do you want to end up that brain dead? Yeah, I mean, if you do, then selectively read the Bible. If but if you if you want to be fair to the text and knowledgeable about the text and understand the Bible, then you have to read the whole Bible. You have to take things in their historical context and you have to understand, maybe dig a little bit into what the actual Hebrew and Greek words um mean and then wow then you realize yes this is a book that was designed to keep people in their place whether they're women or slaves or foreigners of course you can believe in god i even believe in god <laughs> i don't care about that just don't believe in all that gross bible gospel stuff nobody has time for that if you believe it nobody will like you and you want people to like you don't you Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is the martyrdom complex of Christianity. If you're hated and persecuted for for Christ's cause, then that's a good thing. No, you know what, Melissa? Yes, I do want people to like me because I'm a good person and I have empathy. Now, I don't care if everybody likes me because I'm going to be myself. I'm going to be true to my thoughts and my feelings and who I am. And if you don't like that, well... I don't care. I'm plenty of friends. But in general, I try to live my life so that people will say, Michael's a good person. Yeah, like, you know, he's helpful, kind, and he's a good person. So 
yes, it, it, like if you're going to be the kind of person that everybody doesn't like, there's something wrong with you. And going out and preaching these messages of hatred, guess who likes you? The sycophants who have also been brainwashed. Guess who doesn't like you? All the people that you marginalize and hate on. Just try not to think too much. Your feelings are really where it's at. Thinking just creates too much drama and it doesn't let you experience God as deeply. The real you is not up here. It's in here. Who needs critical thinking when this makes you look more tolerant? To hear these words come out of her mouth is enough to make your head explode. She is forgetting her own story here. Because what was her own story? The clip I played at the beginning of this. She didn't become a Christian through critical thinking. She didn't become a Christian because she'd read the Bible and studied and sought for truth. And then eventually over six months or a year, or two or three years, or however long it would take to actually study and know this stuff. She became a Christian in her own words that she she was a different person. Remember what she said? I don't know who that person was yesterday. I didn't recognize who I was yesterday. So in less than 24 hours, she had bought the message and she was committed. And then she spent all the rest of the time of critical thinking already with the conclusion. She already had decided, Melissa, honey, this is not how critical thinking works. You just how little kids think. If you want to be a little kid and believe in things like dragons and fairies and things that mommy and daddy told you, go right ahead. Go right ahead. But don't you dare say that's critical thinking. You are not a critical thinking person, Melissa. You are a indoctrinated zombie. You don't know Hebrew. You don't know Greek. You haven't got a degree in ancient history. You just are being spoon fed stuff by people that have also come to the conclusions before they do the study. And I know this from a fact by listening to your own testimony out of your own mouth. If you already have the answer and then you go study, that that's not how knowledge is obtained. Sorry, this is a fail. I felt like I was this new person. And the second thing was my insatiable hunger to know more about what my friend said. Notice it's not an insatiable hunger to seek the truth. It's a, an insatiable hunger to seek confirmation that what, what she'd already accepted was the truth. Again, that's not how knowledge is obtained. Oh, I sell these in the gift shop, by the way. You can grab one on your way out. It's $6.66. It is a sad commentary on Christianity that they publicly acknowledge that coexistence is impossible. Think about that. Think about the implications of that. And then ask yourself, do I want to align myself with a belief system and a God, even if it was true, even if this God was true, would you want to align yourself with that kind of God? I say that if you love humanity, you love people, and you want to see human beings flourish and have good lives, that you, have, that you must reject that type of exclusivity because it's hateful. It's a form of bigotry and generally racism included that that marginalizes most other people on the planet and most other people who have ever lived because because you've been chosen because you are special because God loves you and he hates everybody else. It's really a sick ideology. If people disagree with you, it just means they're not as enlightened as you are. Or they're just intolerant. Well, it's good to see she can mock herself. I just don't think she actually recognizes it. That she, her belief system is that 
she's enlightened and she's been given the truth. Now remember, she didn't go out and seek and read the Bible and study and 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 then have a, a, an eventual understanding that Christianity was true. No, she had an emotional response to her friend's explanation. And in one day she became a believer and believed it and then spent the time to go out and confirm what she already believed. To believe, to believe that you were given this enlightenment so that you know the truth and then God denied that everybody else is it's again it imagine that you were one of a, a dozen siblings and one day your father calls you all together and he says you know I've decided to send five of you down into the basement locked up and you're going to be tortured and uh, of the other seven of you you know, five of you are going to have sort of just mediocre lives, but two of you, oh, I'm going to select two of you and I'm going to treat you very well. In fact, the, the one, the one show, the one chosen one, you will have riches in an easy life and health. What kind of father would do that? Or I could put, I could give you another analogy. Let's say the father calls in his dozen kids and he says, Hey, here's, here is how to live a life that will please me and lead to blessing. Okay, hold on. Seven of you, I need you to go away because I'm not going to I'm not going to reveal it to you and I'm going to send you over here to this other person who you're going to trust, your like your like your mother for instance, and she's going to feed your ears with lies and deceptions and I'm not going to do anything to stop it. I'm going to allow you to be deceived. I'm going to allow you to have your free will. Do you see how disgusting this theology is and this worldview and this idea? It's disgusting. It's and it's and it's obviously not describing a loving God. It's describing a monster God. You just don't get it because you think you're enlightened and chosen. You think you have the truth. And then you work all these machinations to, to somehow in your own mind, come up with logical reasons why this God is loving instead of a brutal, sadistic monster, which you would you would agree if we if we made any father, any human father on Earth act the way God acts, you would instantly recognize that that was a bad father and that he shouldn't be allowed to have children. Why the double standard? Be constantly positive to the point of ignorance and gullibility. Tell me, Melissa, how many people come to become Christians through non-gullible means, like a year of really, really studying comparative religions, reading the Bible, the Quran, the Vedas, and talking to different professors of different religions and really digging into the, the context of the books and come on. No, uh, almost nobody. Gullibility describes your conversion story. You just felt good and bought the story. Stop. You need to suspend all critical thinking in the name of love and positivity. Yeah, this love and positivity stuff sucks. I mean, do you realize the opposite of that is hatred and negativity? And as far as gullibility, we've already confirmed that's you, Melissa. You were gullible. With you, by your own testimony, you were gullible. Gullibility describes most Christians because most Christians do not study this stuff and don't even know the Bible very well. They're just going with what they've been told by authority figures. That's the vast majority of people that are Christians. They were raised in it or they came to it through emotional means and any apologetics that they engage in comes after the fact. That is the very definition of gullibility. I'm not confusing. You're misunderstanding. If you're confused, then it must mean that truth really can't be known. So just remain in constant uncertainty as long as you're absolutely certain that nothing is certain. See, it's not confusing at all. This is one of the 
wonderful mysteries of Christianity so that a Christian can say it's not confusing. It's right there in the Bible. And all you have to do is ask God and he will give wisdom. In fact, that was one of the funny things that Alyssa Childers said on when the, when she came on the show with Melissa is, is the one promise in the Bible is if you ask for wisdom, God will give it. And then later in the interview, she says, well, I don't know everything. Well, which is it? Does God give wisdom to everybody? Is that the one promise God promises that prayer? The one promise God promises or not? And if God promises to give you wisdom, then that means you should know everything or not, right? So yes, it is confusing if you try to make sense of what the Bible actually teaches, what the Bible actually says. And, and the proof of that is there are many people that come across as, you know, disingenuously sweet and nice like Melissa does, who believe completely different things from her. And her position is those people are going to hell and leading people to hell because they're wrong. It doesn't matter if they're nice and they're sweet and they're kind. They're wrong. They got the, the wrong message. They're being deceived by Satan. And oh, but the Bible is so clear. It's so obvious. Now, as far as absolute truth and absolute, like, and, and the objective thing, okay, look, I'll grant you. There's absolute truth and there's absolute objectivity. You just don't know what they are and you can't know. Am I absolutely certain about that? Yeah, I'm, that's one thing I'm absolutely certain about is that you can't know absolute certainty. It's impossible. It's impossible to know that. Now, that, now, here's the trick. You could be knowing things that are absolutely true, but you'd have no way to know. There's no test to know if it's absolutely true. Like, you could be 99.9999% sure. Like, and there's things like math. Like, is two times two, four? Well, yeah, we're pretty much absolutely certain about that. But w would there be ways to find out tomorrow that, that you've been deceived and that you're that, that somehow you're wrong about stuff. Don't people get deceived all the time? Well, yeah. So if you don't maintain and she had, like, so she's mocking this idea of remaining constantly uncertain about things, but that that's the essence of, of being somebody that wants to know the truth and wants to know knowledge is you can never just say, Oh, I absolutely know this thing. Do you understand that? Like, you, if, like if, if you don't leave some, at least some small percentage for doubt and skepticism, even if it's one in a million chance, if, if, if you, if everything in your life, you go like, oh, the probability of that is one, there's no room for change. That no matter what information I get, I'll never change. Well, then you're not really a thinker. You're just, you're a dogmatic robot. You're not actually thinking. You don't actually know anything if you, take that position. Oh, I've been told this. So that's the truth. And God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Discussion's over. Unity is much more important than having correct theology. You don't want to be divisive now, do you? Don't be that person. I challenge you to read John chapter 17 and ask yourself, when Jesus asked God to grant the early church and those that will come to believe after unity in the same way that Jesus was unified with God, and God didn't answer that prayer because the church is anything but unified. And Jesus said, so that the church, so that the world will know that you and I are one. How is it that your disunity does not prove conclusively that Jesus was not sent by the Father. Ask yourself that. Re just go read John 17 and ask yourself, did God answer the prayer of Jesus? And you can take two things away from that. One, Jesus was not sent by the Father by his own admission. And two, if God the Father doesn't even answer the prayers of Jesus, what hope do you have? You idiots will fall for that, won't you? One of the things that Melissa and I agree on is that most people are deceived and that religion's a huge thing that deceives people. And so when she, when she mockingly says, well, you know, you idiots will fall for that, she's excluded herself from this group of people that 
are indoctrinated, deceived, and tricked because she's got the right God, the right faith, the right understanding, and all you other fools are just stupid, are deceived, yada, 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 yada. Jesus gets you. He gets all of you. He is just like you. Here, Melissa mocks her own religious system's orthodoxy because Christian orthodoxy teaches that Jesus was fully human. So if Jesus doesn't get you, if Jesus is not just like you, then the entire sacrifice he went through is meaningless. That is Christian orthodoxy. I don't know how she gets off mocking her own orthodoxy. Maybe she's not orthodox. Maybe she believes Jesus wasn't fully human. I don't know, but it's funny to hear her mock her own faith. And this is this is a reference to the Super Bowl commercial where Jesus is portrayed as being loving and kind to other people and different races and different sexual orientations and people that are struggling. And of course, um, these bigoted, hateful people like Melissa, the high priestess of hate, she can't stand Jesus being portrayed as somebody that just loves everyone where they're at. To her, that is disgusting because her Jesus is a demanding, judgmental, hellfire and brimstone Jesus that is going to send most people to hell and has sent most people to hell. And the only way to escape hell is to follow this white European Protestant evangelical Christianity that Melissa knows she knows because she had a experience and within 24 hours she had bought it hook, hook line and sinker and now she's done she's devoted her life to confirming that she has the right conclusion from that amazing emotional experience she had and she's going to preach to thousands of people on the internet how they too can believe the right stuff and be like her you know what melissa i'll say i said this before and i'll say it again if your religion is true and you're right I will take hell, I will stand with Satan because nothing sounds worse to me than spending an attorney with hateful, ugly bigots like you because you are hateful, you are exclusive, you're a bigot, and you're preaching hate. I don't know how you wake up in the morning and feel good about yourself. Oh, wait, you're a Christian, so I know you don't feel good about yourself. You look at the Bible, it tells you, I, I am like filthy menstrual rags. Oh, but Jesus will wash me clean. No, you know what? A real adult pays for their own sins. Anyway, I'm going to wrap this up. This is Michael Beverly. If you like this content, please share. Please subscribe. Please leave a comment if you disagree with me, if you want to troll me, if you want to tell me that I'm the one that's hateful or I'm stupid or whatever. Knock yourself out. And at the end of the day, if you, if you want to be an honest Christian, if you want to be an honest Christian, you got to go study the Bible in its entirety. And you got to try to work out all these, all these problems. And if you can do that and convince yourself it's still true and good and that God's actually loving, well, fine. Enjoy heaven. I certainly don't want to be there with you. Sorry. I actually like people. And, and. A heaven that doesn't include everyone sounds to me like hell.